Welcome back. Um, decade in the day here on Off The Ball. We're live on our OTB social channels from 7am to 10pm. And on OTB Sports Radio, you can catch us on offtheball.com and go loud. Now, coming up in this hour, we're going to take a look back at women's sport for the last decade and a look ahead at 2020. So I'm joined by Roisin, Roisin Upton, uh, Irish international hockey star and four-time All-Ireland winner Sinead Ahern. Um, welcome. How are you guys? Good. Good. Ready Thank for you. Christmas? Already? Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you look prepared. Um, before we get into all of the decade stuff, um, tell us a little bit about your involvement in goal. Because you guys were over in Malawi, was it, recently? We were, yeah. Um, I became an ambassador for Goal over the last couple of months. I've been working them for the last year and uh, had the fantastic opportunity to accompany uh, Sinead and Jenny Murphy um, to Malawi and basically just to see the work that Goal does over there. Okay. Um, I think we were pretty blown away mm. by what we saw, uh, you know, how little people have yet, how happy they were. And I think it wasn't until I came home that I actually realised, do you know how fortunate we are, really? Yeah. Um, so it was a jam-packed couple of days. And what's their involvement over there? What, are they, what do they do? So the main things they do is educational programmes. Yeah, so I suppose, I mean, goal, they obviously have emergency response as, as, you know, a big part of the aid that they give. But I think, you know, what we were going to see, which is really interesting, is more the kind of sustainable development um, work that they're involved in. So yeah. in terms of Malawi, a project that they're working um, with for uh, four years in, in terms of 80 villages, and it's, you know, working across the spectrum of nutrition, uh, female hygiene, uh, education, and just, you know, to, to I suppose, integrate these things into the community in, in a way that they can grow it on and, and take it on and adapt to climate change and, and everything. So it's okay. multifaceted, but really interesting to see the work on the ground. And it's for you guys to just have a look and come back and talk about it as ambassadors really afterwards, was it? Yeah, uh, you know, I suppose, yeah, to, to get a sense of the projects, to, to be able to, yeah, to, to speak about it, to, to bring a bit of, you know, a bit more awareness, awareness to, to it, what, yeah. what Gold are doing yeah. um, and the, the great work. And I suppose, uh, as Roisin was, was kind of saying, how a small bit can actually go a long way and just, uh, I suppose, have a, a real concept of, of that message. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's have a look back at your decade. Um, I'll start with you, Roisin, because it's been very quiet for you guys, obviously. Nothing really <laughs> happening in hockey. Um, but hockey was definitely put on the map this year. I remember I was at a, a wedding in uh, Tralee and all of a sudden all of the weddings started going because they were watching the semi-final no of the World Cup. And I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> like everyone's just migrated to the bar in the middle of the, in the, middle of the wedding. So like, how did you guys feel about it? Did, were you a bit... I, I often wonder, are you a bit disappointed because you were so involved in it for so long that suddenly people are now paying attention? It's funny, actually, we always talk about when we were tiring, to getting to be on the other side, you know, in the yeah. stadium, enjoying that aspect of it. Um, so I definitely look forward to that down the line. But yeah, I suppose while it's happening, you're in a bubble and you don't really realise yeah. the magnitude of it. You know, I don't know if I even realise it now because there's just such a boom with women in sport and we're just happy that hockey's on the map and that we're part of it. Yeah, yeah. And how did you get involved? How did you end up in, in hockey? Yeah. Um, I started in secondary school. It was just the sport for girls. Um, wasn't particularly good, but I gave it a go. And once you have friends playing, you know, yeah, um, yeah I just went for it from there. And um, what your first year was 2016, was it? With the Irish, Irish team. team. Yeah, yeah, I got my first cap in 2016. I had just been out for a year after double hip surgery. Um, so I was very out of shape. Oh my gosh. And right. um, there was a couple of injuries. Megan Fraser, our captain at the time, to our ACL. Yeah. Um, so Graham Shaw was the head coach and he gave me a call over in America where I was studying, saying, you know, is there any chance you can come back for a series against Scotland? Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was so grateful for that opportunity. Like, I hadn't played hockey in a year and I was kind of out of the scene being over there, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, is it difficult? Like, we always talk about women's sports, well, that there's a huge balance between what you have to do in your professional life and training as everything else that you have to do on the pitch how d how did that work out for you yeah it's definitely a challenge but i'd say it's probably we don't know any different really yeah in our whole lives and i think it's yeah you, you just get used to training just being on the schedule and you don't even think about it. it's an automatic and you just sort of build yeah. it into your schedule and i know you know when you're trying to do a bit yourself in, in the off season it's a lot harder sometimes if you actually give yourself that i uh, will i won't i and i i think we're just used to it you just just become part program, of it yeah and, yeah, yeah yeah and for yourself sinead like I think the LGFA is just one of those things where it's become really, really recognisable, the impact of this last decade. Like, it's just been a huge change. We've had record audiences, a lot more people going to games. Are you guys starting to feel that off the back of that for the teams? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I suppose when you talk about attendance, there's, you know, different aspects to it. There's obviously the, the, the turnout on the big day. Um, we're still trying to work backwards in terms of building up attendances at, at the earlier um, stages and the earlier rounds. But, you know, even in terms of the finals at the start of the decade, all you could hear was, you know, hooters and kids and they'd be cheering wides and, and everything. And it's a great family 
day out. But I guess you sort of felt the profile of the crowd, are they really engaged yeah. in the actual game itself? Whereas I think at the end of the decade, you know what's going on by the feel of the crowd, by the reactions. If you have your back turned to the game, you know something's happened with an incident in terms of, you know, the profile, I think, of the people going to, to see the games is, is, has changed um, in terms of, you know, people that are watching the game for what it is rather than just going to support it on one day out. Yeah. And I mean, like the, so you won an All Ireland in 2010, started the decade, and ended it with 2019. Mm. So, like, has there been, in terms of training and stuff like that, and the attention that are paid to teams or money invested in it, has that been massively changed over the last decade as well? Yeah, I think it has. Um, you know, look, I think there's still, with, with female sports and, and, and that, I think you're still trying to get coaching in and you know the right structures yeah. in place to actually yeah. support teams and I think the game on the pitch can really take off once you have those structures and investment in in place um, and over that that decade you can you can definitely see the impact that that we've had but but equally going out and trying to get that on board people are more willing to to support women's uh, you know sport to to invest they're interested in it and um, they're engaged with it so I think um, you know the opportunities are, are there going into the next decade for for teams to actually get the right structures in place and to, to really grow from there because you know when people are looked after when they feel that they're part of you know a professional setup sure yeah it works both ways in terms of they give more because they're getting you know more back from it in terms yeah. of how, how, how they're being looked after and in terms of the last decade like we always talk about 20 by 20 and that whole movement do you feel like that's actually made a huge difference yeah i think we had to start somewhere yeah. and 20 by 20 was a fantastic start i'd say probably you know can't wait to see the figures i'd say we've blown it out of the water um but at the same time, it was so minuscule, really. When you think about it, you know, you're looking for a 20% increase in the media and participation and all the rest like of what it was, which was nothing. Um, so it was a great start, but I'm excited to build on it now and see, you know, what, yeah, what the girls have planned. Absolutely. In terms of um, your per personal highlights, what was the moment when you went, this is amazing, I can't believe this is actually happening over the last decade? Um, <laughs> of all sporting highlights, God, no, been... just just for yourself in terms of the Irish hockey team and like what what was it when I I mean the penalty shoot I, I think nearly gave everyone in the country a heart attack, but <laughs> which, how, which one? <laughs> <laughs> God, that last that last qualifying one was like going. <laughs> it wasn't the plan. Um, yeah, I suppose like up until Donnybrook, it definitely would have been at the World Cup, and when yeah. we came home and we were on Dane Street and we thought it would be a complete flop, like us having a homecoming, we were a bit embarrassed to have one. Oh, no. But then there was thousands of people there, and we were like, "Oh my God, this is insane!" Yeah. Um, but I think now Donnybrook has has yeah leaped over it because it's just you just never imagined you know putting down a hockey pitch on a rugby pitch. Firstly, like that's insane to have that partnership with Leinster Rugby. Yeah. Um, and just for so many people to show up still, you know, as Sinead is saying. Like it's such a family event. Um, there's people travel from all over the country, and um, that know about hockey and that are passionate about hockey. Mm. Um, you know, and I'm still bumping into people, and they're telling me where they came from, and you know they couldn't get over the weather on the Saturday night, and yeah. I suppose just the happiness that they saw when we finally qualified, or the relief, I suppose, in many ways. So yeah, yeah, yeah that entire weekend. And do you feel like, I, I, you know, when you were watching, we were watching hockey and a lot of people were coming to it new, didn't understand the rules, were screaming at the TV and didn't know have a clue yeah. what was going on. Like, how, how does that make, like, do you feel like you've put that on the map here and that people are really just getting into the sport now? Yeah, I think, you know, once people are talking about it, yeah. um, we're such a competitive country and we compete in so many different sports. So to be up there and being spoken about with, you know, DAA, with rugby, soccer, boxing, um, as one of the main was, sports, yeah, yeah, that was one of the goals, you know, to yeah. put us on the map here, but also on a, I suppose, on a team level to put us on the map in the world so that other countries know about us and know that we're competitive. But, you know, we don't also want it to be, I suppose, a couple of years that we're competitive and that we're competing and that it'll go down the history books. Like we really want this to be the start of something for our hockey. So when we all retire, you know, that there'll be those systems and structures in place to be coming through. And I think that is one of the biggest challenges that. You yeah. were saying to implement. You don't be talking about retirement now, that's twice. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to stress on that. We might have Shit a breaking on. news story here that I don't know about. <laughs> Sinead, what was your kind of moment over the last decade for yourself and the Dublin team that you felt, wow, we've really, we've really done something special here? Yeah, and look, I suppose I, we mentioned that we started the decade having won in All-Ireland, um, our first ever for Dublin, which was, you know, a huge breakthrough for us. Yeah. Um, we'd been in... I think that was our fourth final um, since so 2003, 2004, 
then hit a few uh, rough years, shall we say. Um, <laughs> back in All Ireland 2009. We won't talk about that. Everything was fine uh, at the end. The start, <laughs> the start of our, our good run of losing to uh, to Cork by by a point here and there. Um, so yeah, to win it in 2010 was a great breakthrough for Dublin. Um, mm. We didn't really consolidate that. We probably had um, come to the end of a natural cycle of a team and you know, again, went through a period of transition, um, getting back to All-Ireland Finals and not getting over it. So I suppose to make the breakthrough again in 2017 was was really important. And I think what we really wanted to do from that and that group yeah. uh, was to consolidate that and make sure that the, the future for, for Dublin was kind of on the right path and, and not going to sort of disappear again. So, yeah, to be able to, to put three back to back has been brilliant for us. And like what strikes me as well about so much of that Dublin team is a lot of those girls are household names now. Mm. People know them, they recognise them on the TV, they know who they are. That's just massive in terms of bringing people through in the game, isn't it? Yeah, and, and you know, 20 by 20 is part of that in terms of putting, you know, Role faces models, to yeah. to stories, to, to coverage. I mean, you pick up the newspaper and you read a story about, you know, a head-to-head duel and, and you're looking out for that when you go to see a game. And if you don't have that visibility, you don't have an interest in the game that you're watching because you've no sort of context for what you're watching or, or why you're watching it or why, she, why you should care yeah. about it. So I think to be able to improve that visibility, to, to put players out there as, you know, background and history and context to it is, is great because then people will tune in and say, I know this players want to watch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Roshan, to go back, I'm sorry, I have to go back to the penalty shoot that again. But just in terms of, like you were playing with an injury that you didn't even know you had. So was that, did, were you aware of it on the court at all? Or? Uh, it was a bit sore. Yeah, yeah. I remember shaking my wrist a few times not knowing what it was. But And like, everyone was depending on you. <laughs> like, I don't see it like that. <laughs> you know, like I've played hockey now for over 10 years and... You know, shootouts are what we practice all the time, so mm. I've done hundreds and thousands of them. So I suppose, yeah, given the moment, you know, it was really important. But I suppose I was just happy I had the chance to redeem myself. And I think, you know, it just shows um, how such a small gesture of Sean asking me to do it, well, you know, like impacted me hugely and just filled me with self-belief. Um, yeah. But I suppose you think you can think about it funny, you know, just because you scored the first one doesn't mean you're going to score the second one either. Absolutely, and just because yeah. you missed the first one, you know, mistake. Is there so second. much pressure in because the tension coming from the TV was unbelievable. So I can only imagine what was happening <laughs> there. Like, is that um, do you feel that or you can't completely block it all out? You know, the atmosphere yeah. is there. Um, and especially when we went three one down and I just turned to Nikki Daly and I was like, oh, if you know, if Canada score now, you know, we're gone. And I said it exactly like that, and she was like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. Don't tell me that. I don't need this. And then, yeah, and then we counted like that for the next four. I was like, oh, Aisha has to save this one. You know, oh, Chloe has to score this one. And we were kind of like hushing, your like whispering to each other. Yeah. And we were like, hey, don't tell Chloe that she has to score this one. <laughs> the <laughs> quality like she's probably aware of yeah, it. Yeah, but yeah. Like, yeah. But the quality of the penalties is unbelievable. I mean, oh, the, last, the, the, the last few penalties are just... I just the it's just such a marvel. But, yeah. like, I, I look at sports people, and I'm like, in that moment... When that's so much tension and pressure, how do you get through that? And I think that's the difference between somebody just going out to play a bit of knockabout or somebody actually being brilliant at their sport, you know? I suppose you thrive off it in many ways, though, don't you? Adrenaline. Like, you actually love that pressure and the adrenaline, yeah, of stepping up to take it and not, like, it's not going to sink in what it actually means if you, if you score or not. But I always prefer to be in control of where I'm going or, you know, I hate to be watching. Yeah. So, like, it's harder to watch the others than step up and take your own. Yeah. But, I mean, neither of my penalties were particularly good. I mean, the first one obviously wasn't good. I ran out of time. But then the second one, I dragged so far wide, I didn't move her quick enough. And, you know, I was lucky to sneak it in because she came off her line. Um, but, like, do you know what? They weren't great penalties. Like, if you compare it to Chloe's and Nicky's <laughs> and Beth's, like, they were finishing from a tight angle. You're being too hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah. I know, like, That's such a great feature, though, of, of the game, that you have, like, these really exciting, tense sort of finales that, that pop up. Like, yeah. It's, it's yeah, they've it. been a good addition, I think. Yeah, it used to be a penalty stroke, just like a penalty kick in soccer um, or in football. Yeah. Um, and the onus is always on the player to score. You know, it wasn't really a chance for the goalkeeper, where it's, it's much more exciting now. When it's way more. And down, especially with someone seconds. like Aisha as well, who's just going to take oh, somebody on. Moving her pads, level. though. I mean, she must have to train literally. She to is so agile. I can't even tell you. Like, she's a ballerina feet. Absolutely. They were trying to get her onto um, one of the dancing shows. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> but she would sense. actually, she's so good. <laughs> when, when you're scheduled, um, hours, I'm sure. Oh, she's just like the whole personality around her and everything as well. Like everyone was just so behind. She's just amazing. Um, how did you feel about the change in management this year? Or how did that, how did that affect the team or did it affect you guys? Um, I suppose the goal didn't change in terms of trying to qualify. It wasn't ideal timing, but in many senses, they made the transition very simple by 
uh, putting her assistant coach in as the interim and then Sean Dancer got hired and he had a period of about four to six weeks where he could actually just observe which I think is probably very dreamy for a new coach coming into a team to see you know what I do like about the squad what I can keep in place and you know things that I might try to change yeah um so yeah that was great and then Sean took over in July and so yeah it hasn't been an overall like cause it can be a difficult process sometimes no, it wasn't. It was actually really smooth, yeah. That's you good. know, you're trying to stay as focused as you can. We had three major tournaments, Banbridge, the Europeans, and then, of course, the Canada Series. Um, yeah. So there isn't time to be... Yeah, yeah, yeah. ...dwelling Thinking. on anything. <laughs> exactly, yeah. You're not overthinking anything. Um, Sinead, I wanted to ask you about record numbers because we were talking about this just before we came on air, and we have seen record numbers go to those games. Uh, the finals have been unbelievable. Mm. Do you think... <clears throat> that we need to start moving away from that a little bit, that we probably need to start looking at consistent average times that people will go to games during the year. Is it too much about the record audiences at this stage? Um, I guess across the spectrum of sports, no. Um, in terms of, you know, the hockey got record attendance this year, the rugby got record attendance. Again, the, the GEA, uh, the ladies football final, beat its numbers. Camogie had great numbers. On their own, they're all important numbers. I guess when you look into each game, the, the ladies football final has been growing over the last um, few years and the narrative has very much been, you know, the record, the record. I think within our own game, it is the right time to start moving away from talking about the numbers and, yeah. and focusing more on the average and, and how you can sustain that. But I do think they made a start with that this year in terms of moving the, the semi-finals into Crow Park, which, you know, is a big venue and, and obviously all the arguments about whether that is the right venue, you're, you're not going to fill that uh, straight off the bat. So. We got ten thousand in. I mean, last year at our at our double header, um, it was actually three games on on the bill that day: the two uh, senior semi finals and an intermediate semi final. I think we maybe had three four thousand down in Hyde Park and Roscommon. So look, that's that's an increase. It's an improvement. It's yeah. trying to put these things in the map, and I do think the right way to approach it has been to start from top down and and try and build the the game the recognition at the at the top when you've got. I guess you're hoping your your best teams competing at it. Yeah get that exposure to the game from people and then try and trickle that back down. Um, I think it's it's probably the right approach, but I do think we've started to move away and I think we need to continue to move away to try and focus on what the numbers are throughout the championship and moving back into the league. Yeah, well. absolutely. Yeah. In terms of the final itself, it was a hard slog for you guys in the end. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was not It was not pretty. It's not one that's going to be on a I didn't want to say year. not pretty, but no. it, was, it was tough going. No, it won't be on a, the highlights reel for this year. I don't, I don't I think. think. It most certainly will, um, Dora. No, look, I think, yeah. look, it was a... Three in a row. Not big deal, just three in a row. No, look, I mean, both teams, I think, just probably the nature of the conditions became a bit cagey and the game itself, while it was probably fascinating from a tactical perspective and a defensive perspective, yeah. it wasn't a high scoring, in you know, uh, high skilled game, I don't think. I think both teams just didn't get a chance to really showcase that um, on the day for, you know, the conditions obviously played a big part and I think, you know, we maybe withdrew it into ourselves a little bit because of that. So mm. there's lessons to be learned in that. The two finals that we'd be in previously were great days. The, the men's final the day before was, was a cracking day. So look, it happens. <laughs> I um, know, I know. It's such bad luck. Yeah, um, <laughs> it was. But look, it was a fascinating tactical battle as well. Galway came um, on the day with, uh, you know, a really uh, good... Uh, set up um, and just you know we we just didn't get out of the blocks I don't think um, and the game sort of started to get a bit even more and more yeah. cagey as, as we're waiting for a score I mean it just it was 22 minutes when you're waiting for a score and you don't I you know. know you don't see that yeah. in games it's Where? it's bizarre do you and know? suddenly they, they start talking about it because yeah. it definitely feel like yeah, I, I sometimes I feel like you get more criticised and it's just like, why would anyone want to watch this? And you're like, hang on a second, this is still a really good game. Yeah, and the two semi-finals were, were great games. Yeah, they were absolutely. fantastic. I mean, Galway Mayo was, was an unbelievable game. Um, really tight finish, really exciting finish as well. Um, and our, our game of Cork, I think, again, was another tactical battle, but it was more attacking in nature, um, yeah. just, you know, by the, by the nature of the game. So... Look, it's uh, as I said, it's it's not a scoreline <laughs> you'll ever look back on pride with, but we we got the the victory and you know performance is there to be worked out. I guess. Been too hard on yourself. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so funny how people look at like Gaelic football and hurling and just want the big scores, but yeah, like the tactical side of it is so fascinating. Yeah, it is, and it's a, it's an a, it's an area of the game that has developed. I think over the last few years in yeah. in ladies football, in terms of teams are putting a more emphasis on you know how do we set up, how do we structure, how do we 
get the right balance, yeah. how do we counteract what other teams are doing at certain times in the game. So I think it's a, it's a great development to the game. It's just, you know, the conditions this year just weren't great, for, great. for football, yeah. unfortunately. And in terms of like since 2010, um, have you seen, noticed a big change in backroom staff and the approach to that within Dublin? Um, yeah, look, I guess over the years, um, different setups come in. Um, you know, we've been three All-Ireland finals with Greg. He'd, he'd, he'd brought Dublin on. Um, and then I suppose we had a change with Mick coming in and, and he brought a, a, a bigger management team, I guess. Um, but all with very defined, you know, roles in terms of working with the backs or the forwards or the performance side of things, be it strength and conditioning or, or nutrition or whatever. And it's funny how you think, you don't think of it as a big team and then at the end of the year it gets to the thank yous and I'm kind of going, gee, there's a lot of people oh, I need to remember year, here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because they all had a, had a big part to play. Um, and, and I think this year we probably had a lot of issues just with, um, injuries and stuff that people had going on personally so to actually have that sort of larger support team for people to be able to link in with individuals maybe as, as much as yeah. the overall team was was really important for how we managed to, to get through the year and, and to perform well enough to, to win. And you came back fighting as well over the last three years because it must have been so disappointed off the back of the losses but it was a real there's a real when, when I remember watching was it 2017 just mm. felt like it was reinvigorated yeah You've changed around some of the setup everything just looked great yeah I, you know i think i suppose when mick came in i remember him saying he, he probably had 15 crisis chats with people <laughs> at the end of the season going i can't Gosh. do it again and, you know there's no more i can't take it <laughs> so um yeah i think he probably was taken aback at how much I guess baggage we probably had, you know, from, from three years and are we going to turn it around or are we just like punishing ourselves, knocking our heads off a brick wall again? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it was a, a, I suppose a change of approach, um, you know, a different voice um, and yeah, we just, I guess, reinvigorated and as you said. Well, some of the um, people moved out, like I think it was Noel was moved out of her position and everyone mm. was like, what's happening? Yeah, it was like yeah, a change of idea. Yeah, and I mean, she went into centre back for a while, which I think we all agree was an experiment. <laughs> Best left in the past, but it it changed. I guess uh, even doing making changes like that gets people thinking about the game and and their own role and, and yeah. how they you know they fit into the team because they're kind of going. I never saw this position from this aspect and what I could bring back to mind. So yeah, I mean we we worked on a lot of different stuff. I suppose around you know different tactics or positions or approaches to the game as well. So sure. um, yeah, it's been it's been a, an interesting few years. How do you feel about the people that are going to Australia and stuff like that? Are you going to lose? Are you Sinead Goldrick gone? Mm. Is she going to be gone for the whole year or is she back? Or how's that uh, going to work? and Eve. Now, as far as I know, um, both are, are back at the end of the season. So it depends, obviously, on how their team gets on. Yeah. Um, I think it's run over a pretty short space of time through sort of February, March um, in their regular season. Um, sure. And then if they get on to the next stage, they'll see. But, I, I you know, as far as I know, both of the their intentions is to uh, to be back yeah. in, in the fold. I, I, we don't have a Leinster Championship this year, unfortunately. Um, um, we're the only senior team left, so we have a bit of extra time um, in terms of when we actually start games. So right. they'll have a chance to, I guess, get back into the, the, the fold for a while and play some club football and get get back up to speed with the, a round ball. So. <laughs> I was looking at Sinead's um, Insta stories yesterday with her training. I was like, she's going to come back in great shape. Yeah, I, I, yeah as long as they're not injured. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, a, well, yeah. it's yeah. an interesting... It's like, like, yeah. 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 Um, just in terms of like favourite moment of the decade in general then, is there something that struck you within women's sport or any sport that was like that's that was amazing like we, some of the ones that we had over the last few days like Shane Lowry winning the Open and Katie Taylor's gold and stuff like that but is there something that you were like that was a real moment in this decade and it was amazing yeah I'm going to embarrass Roshi now I'm going to say <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, you're a bit of a fan yeah. there <laughs> She's, yeah. been <laughs> She's been slagging me since yeah. Malawi. <laughs> yeah. I uh, think another big one is the O'Donovan brothers. Um, you know, in their famous interviews, it was it was the first rowing medal at an Olympics. Yeah. Um, so it was pretty historical, and I think rowing has just come on leaps and bounds in the past couple of years since. Um, you know, Olympic medals are hard to come by. I think we've won 12 since 2000. Yeah, and water uh, sports, and five weirdly, up. over the last years has suddenly become so big. With Annalise, yeah, yeah. That was another one, yeah, yeah. Having come back from the disappointment in London to get her silver in Rio, like, that was huge. I mean, like, we actually talked to her and off the bench talking about coming back from something like that and she was distraught when she came back and how she got herself into that frame of mind was just unbelievable. 
But yeah, many dark days over those four yeah. years, I'd say, yeah, preparing for it again when you're that close coming forth. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. real hard going. And Sunita puts poor as well in terms of their own as well. She's been, you know, she's had a great couple of years and difficult, um, you know, personal circumstances this year with her, with her sister. And yeah. to, to be able to, to win a gold after that, that was I think so it's emotional. just mental fortitude and, and you know, a, a boost, I suppose, for, for the family. But she's, she's had a great few years as well. Yeah. So, Davy, your mum was the decade? Yeah, well, you're obviously, you mentioned Katie Taylor, and I think, uh, <laughs> I think that was saying. just, yeah, it goes without saying. Well, really. it's, it's because we, we did a role models roadshow where we talked about some of this stuff, and who they all said Sonia. They said that her, their role model was Sonia, mm. but it was, Katie said it. And I was like, it's so funny because everyone just thinks that Katie is the role model and she's naming Sonia. Yeah. It's just this amazing. Yeah, it was just, I mean, it being in London, you could nearly feel the atmosphere through the television screen. Were you, you in know? London for No, I wasn't. I wasn't in London, but I'm saying even on the ops, even through a screen. I yeah. The support that she got, um, you know, the build-up. Huge build up, amount of support. Amount I was actually pressure. in London at the time. There's a huge amount yeah, of support for yeah. her. And to be able to perform and to, to carry it through. The and get journey she's had over action mm. the whole decade. Yeah. Like she had such disappointment in Rio and she has bounced back. Unbelievably. Yeah. Mm. She's just taken over the world. She needs a new wardrobe for her belts. Like she <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I know. And that documentary as well, just pulling the curtain back a little bit, was unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking forward to 2020 and into the next decade. Um, in terms of hockey, you have your schedule now for this year. We do, yeah. <laughs> you look busy. a bit scared. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bit of change. We actually, we usually worked by month and then it was like, you know what you're doing this month and then we'll come out of schedule, but it's great. Yeah, yeah we have a six month plan now. It's exciting. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, and that's all your dates for 2020, really? Pretty much locked in, yeah. yeah. There might be a couple of changes in April, May, but it's pretty set in stone. Yeah, just trying to get as many games as we can. Okay. So they started a pro league um, last year which was basically like the top 10 teams in the world are playing in this league for six months and we aren't in it, men or women. Um, so it's been quite challenging to, I suppose, get games against those teams because their schedules are so busy anyway. Right. So it's yeah. in the second year of it now and it's the same kind of thing, like trying to get games when their schedules are so busy because sure, a lot, a lot of countries are working part time, you know, they are playing their clubs. Yeah. They have a pretty full schedule um okay but sean has managed to get a few yeah so we've good a couple of yeah exciting ones coming up and olympics how are you feeling talking about olympics it's exciting <laughs> yeah so we, he just named sean just named the squad of uh, i think it's 40 to 45 of us yeah um and only 16 go so that's an olympic rule and it's usually 18 um so it's going to be that's a hard it is, uh, isn't it? It's, it's, it's still roll on, roll off in the Olympics yeah. as well, yeah. I think it's an interesting feature to the game as well. At least, roll you know, on, yeah. Off. But 16 yeah, is a small number. Yeah. <laughs> it is. You can bring two reserves and if you get yeah. an injury, somebody can come in. Um, but, yeah, it'll just be a grueling couple of months trying to make it into that. You know, it won't look too much further past it. But as an entire squad, um, like anyone who's competitive, you know, we mentioned how hard it is to win an Olympic medal. But, yeah. you know, that's the goal. Like, you're not Absolutely. going to take part. And how are you guys feeling about it? About medals. Or excited, do you, do you yeah, think I about think medals? Is it just one of those things that you're like, look, we're going to the Olympics, that's the main thing? No, we definitely think about medals. I think that was what, uh, I think that's what you think about, don't you? You think about winning <laughs> No, I think about the process. think about the process? I think about the process. How am I going to get there? The journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I think like, at the end of the day, if you don't have it's that not, feeling yeah. or that, you know, that thing. And, and obviously with, uh, with last year, you've got the, the taste for that, so think about it again yeah and i think i wasn't in squad four years ago but you know our own hockey men made history by being the first team in mm. 60 or 70 years to make it to an olympics um and that really spurred us all on as well you know that's another i think top quality moment of the decade um they had won a bronze medal at the europeans went and qualified for the olympics and there was great buzz around irish hockey so it's great that you know now we're going um yeah it's so huge and enjoyable it will. And everyone will be behind you. I'm on board the bandwagon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good bandwagon, though. It's served as well. Um, Sinead, what are you hoping for this season? Or another All-Ireland? Uh, <laughs> <All -Star. laughs> no, um, yeah, and no, I'm just thinking about the process. <laughs> and, uh, the journey. <laughs> the journey. Yeah. Um, no, look, to be honest, I actually just do really enjoy that. I, I think the challenge to sort of evolve every year and to kind of you know, bring something a bit different or, you know, consolidate what you've been doing well is, is actually what kind of motivates you going back to start yeah. a season because it's a long start to you've take. You've been playing to go since back what, 2003? 2003, yeah. yeah. So That's when you mentioned I made my debut in 2016 <laughs> and you've mentioned retirement twice, I'm like, God, <laughs> things have changed. Ten years breaking news story, we're in ten minutes here. <laughs> um, no, I, I suppose I do actually look forward to kind of getting back into that and seeing where you are. And obviously teams have been back training in a couple of months, we're behind the curve a little bit, so um, yeah. 
yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, where the game moves on to next year, I think. Definitely. Um, just in terms of 2020, and we were talking about 2020 by 20, in terms of coaching or the next generation, what guy, what, how do you see your role within sport? I, I feel like there's a lot more pressure on women, the women's game, than there is in the men's game to bring girls through. Do you guys feel that? or? Uh, yeah, I guess they've had longer to have structures in place and have that yeah. sort of accepted um, path, I guess. And then obviously on the female side of things, if you know people are having uh, family or kids and, and that, uh, there's less time, I guess, for, for people to kind of get back involved. But I think we're probably only moving into that generation now in terms of the acceptability and the, the need for women to go back into coaching from their sport. Um, so I think in the next few years, you will see. Um, people coming back to their sports where they retired, um, you know, in the last sort of five years, um, and hopefully reap some some personal uh, experiences back into the into the system as such. But yeah, I think the coaching aspect is really something that women's sport needs to get right um, yeah. for for the next decade. Because if you don't have the coaching and you don't have teams coming on, and in terms of the skills and and everything like that, you're not going to get people to tune in and watch. So it's. It's the, the the vicious circle that you need to Absolutely. yeah. And would you see yourself involved in it or? <laughs> yeah, coaching. Yeah, um, probably. I guess um, <coughs> my club would be maybe somewhere you'd look to start, but um, I'll probably be playing fo club football for for a few years after I retire yeah. from uh, intercounty. So yeah, we'll see. Um, it depends on, on opportunities and, and all the rest of it. Yeah, and yourself, Roshin. Do you think yeah, there's a pressure there? I do because I think there's to be role models to be like. There's more of an onus on us to promote our sports as yeah. a, in comparison to men. You know, they don't yeah. go and do interviews and be talking about their sport and men in sport. You know, they're just talking about their sport. lives and their training and their experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I think we embrace it. Like, I mean, I enjoy mm. it and enjoy what's happening with women in sport. Yeah. I think it's been interesting to, as well, hear more about what's happening in the other sports and their experiences of it as well. Sometimes yeah. you kind of live in your own silo of when you don't have the exposure to what's going on in, yeah. in other sports as well so it's interesting to to hear what other sports are doing and how they're training and all the rest of how they bring yeah. people through mm. it is hard though like I, I just I always feel like when we did the role models thing Annalise was there and there was a lot of kids coming up to her afterwards but there's there's a lot of pressure on her to be this like shining light for kids and bringing kids through sailing and she does a lot of like mm. training sessions with kids as well I, I just don't think that's the same in the the men's game as much no, and actually the LGFA have launched a programme that they're starting just after Christmas um, in terms of actual media training for, you know, girls like coming through um, yeah. in, in, with teams and, and just sort of how to actually be aware of how to promote your sport and your, I guess yourself and your role within it as much as, you know, you feel comfortable doing just because there is opportunities there for our sports to grow and if we can embrace it, as Roshan kind of said, the men don't do it and um, it's kind of gone insular and sort of you know close the doors and don't let anybody see what we're doing whereas I don't know I think we're a bit more willing to sort of give a bit more of ourselves to is that harder for you guys as well because I mean in terms of access the men's game is just a lot of the teams will just go behind closed doors and won't give you interviews is it harder to be that little bit more open I don't think so like I think for our team anyway we've always just tried to be ourselves tell the story as it was people didn't know much you know, so there wasn't going to be opinions out there. So we're just trying to take it at face value yeah. as much as we could. Um, you know, we don't have media training or anything like that. Um, but it's just different, I think. Yeah. You know, I think another side of it is like growing up watching, like I'm a huge Monster Rugby fan and every week in the newspaper you're hearing about Paul O'Connell, a legend, oh, he's injured this week, oh, he's back in this week, you know, different things that are going on with him. And you're able to follow his career. Yeah. Um, you know, you're not just seeing him once every Saturday and not knowing anything about it. So it's that journey as well of being able to, you know, the dubs have finished and they're off season, but like, I'd love to know what you're doing. Do you know, and I'm sure people would. Yeah. Um, it isn't it's just about the all Ireland. Yeah. Isn't it? yeah. In the it's sport, a story. Yeah. It's we were talking about that before and just in terms of, you know, the coverage that is there is still quite superficial in terms of there's no yeah. real, I guess, you have to build a knowledge of the game to be able to sort of commentate and, and uh, you know, write about games and, and analyse them, I suppose, across a spectrum of a, a season. And sometimes you get the coverage in maybe the quarterfinals or the semis or a big tournament, but there's not necessarily an understanding of where that team has evolved from and what are the things that you're actually watching out for. So I think those are the aspects that we need to build on if we're going to actually generate the momentum to to keep um, growing the sports because you need stories and you need uh, an understanding of who the players are and who you're looking out for and what's the key jewels on the pitch or, you know, whatever it is. And do you feel like it's still just, not 
don't want to say stagnant because it has built, mm. but is it still very basic in its reporting? Yeah, I think maybe part of that has been it's. Let's say for for um, you know, it might be hard to find games that are covered, and therefore, how does a reporter actually you know if are they going to travel to games or are they going to be given. Um, you know, is, is their employer going to send them to a game to cover it in January? There's a lot going on. There's lots of other demands and stuff. It hasn't necessarily happened. And yeah, the next phase is to kind of push the, the you know, someone taking on a, a team or a sport for a season, I think, and trying to, you know, build it. Or, Follow them. Yeah. Because yeah. reporters will always have their own bias and their own interest of what they want to do you know that's why you dream about becoming a reporter and you want to follow this team so yeah it's just trying to yeah find find those people that are interested but i think the argument is a little bit gone about well who's going to read this so yeah. you know or who's going to watch this i think that was really but it's, it's the last that, couple of years it, it feels like it's yeah, just kind of it is that circle though of where do you start like is someone going to watch exactly. this if they don't know Chicken what they're watching or why they're watching it or why they should care i mean if they know nothing about the players they know nothing about the context of the game yeah you're watching it kind of going, I don't really know what I'm looking out for here, if anything. You know, whereas if someone's turning on the Liverpool game, they're going, right, I want to see Mo Salah and Firmino and Mane and, yeah. you know, this great attacking brand of football that Liverpool play. Because that's the narrative that you've, you know, you've got from the coverage and from the games that are available to see. So, yeah. you know, if you don't build um, profiles for the game, you know, people aren't really going to read about them or, or watch them because yeah. I don't they have a context for it. I was, got, I was asking you just before we came in, in terms of criticism of the, like, I still think there's a lot of, aren't the girls great? Look at them out there playing. The lovely girls. Oh, aren't oh, they great? Aren't they brilliant? God, it's uh, raining and they're out today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, can you imagine? Um, God, their makeup. Um, but like, <laughs> there's still a little bit of that. Is it, do you feel like there's a change happening around that, that it's a bit more, like, really, uh, actually, uh, Fiona Steve is one of the people that I want to talk to you about this with, in terms of um, the rugby and the analysis around the rugby, that they they probably deserved a bit of a harsh criticism last like the last couple of years and got, coming off the back of the Grand Slam and everything. Mm. Do you think that that's happening enough? Like, if you have a bad game, do you want people to go, we had a bad game? Like, please tell us we had a bad game. Well, I think, like, you don't need to tell us, you know, you're probably, we're our own yeah. worst critics. Um, yeah. We're very self-aware of how we perform, so I don't think we're in the media enough for it to bother us whether what they're saying, um, yeah. and we're not at the stage. But, yeah, I think, you know, a lot was made out of us qualifying, and, you know, the shootout and everything, but, like, we didn't really perform over the two days, and obviously that wasn't mentioned because of the hype and everything. It was such an historical weekend. Um, but again, I think it comes back to the education, to the people actually writing the articles. How much do they know? What can they compare it to? Like, have they seen us play at the Europeans where we perform very well? Yeah. You know what? Like, how can they say whether that was a good or a bad performance? Because they don't know. Mm. And look, yeah. you're starting from a base, you know, that we've we've spoken about today that, you know, the articles are small and, and right, let's, let's grow that. And then as that size grows or the coverage grows, you can get into a bit more of the, the depth on it. I mean... You know, even since the, I guess the Irish hockey team has done well, that the pieces that I've seen in in the newspapers about the the club scene are getting a little bit bigger, and you you know you know the names that you're you're looking out for when you read it because you're kind of going, oh, I'm going to read this article because I'll see how the the names that I know are doing with their clubs or you know whatever yeah. it is. So I think that's you know an aspect to it, and I think the yeah the self critic or the the criticism piece doesn't necessarily come because I don't think people are going to put themselves out there to be overly critical when they maybe don't have a, 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 a knowledge base. A, enough, enough of a knowledge yeah. base that they're kind of going, look, I could be completely off base here. And yeah. maybe I'm telling, saying this player's absolutely had an absolute stinker and like it's completely out of character for how they've played all season. I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's hard to know sometimes. So it is, yeah. it is the education piece. It's just getting to a point so. where you're able to fairly criticise something. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and like off the back, off the, back of the, the win last year, is I mean, the celebration in Dublin happened with the men's team as well. Mm -hmm. Like, a lot of you guys were saying that that was brilliant. That was exactly what you guys needed. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, it was a weekend that I, I don't think is going to come around again for a while. I mean, like, the, the history in terms of what the men did with, with five in a row um, and 
it being on the same weekend, I mean, just the way it happened with a replay, it, it's a fixture, sort of, you know, everything came together that it happened like that and it was great um, to be able to celebrate the success that team teams have had and many people are lo looking at that saying, is that going to go on forever? But it's not, That's it's not the way it goes with teams and cycles and, and all the rest of it. So to be able to celebrate it in that manner, I think, for, for both teams was was a great day for the, for the city and, you know, the, we, we, got a, we got a good day again that day to be out, <laughs> to be out in the sunshine, um, which, you know, down in Marion Square, which, which was lovely and it was uh, really nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah, the rest of the country <laughs> were like, would you get this tripe off the TV again? But, uh, yeah. incredible. <laughs> um, what's your hope then for the, the next decade? Either personally within your sport or in, for women's sport in general. And I know if we're having a discussion, like we probably shouldn't be saying just women's sport, but sport in general. <laughs> yeah. I guess for my sport, for, for GA, I'd like to see um, teams being given the the tools to, to, to keep developing and um, I suppose I think we've seen over the last five years how we've been able to make progress in terms of getting the right structures in place with management with our county board um, you know is fully supportive of, of what we're doing with fundraising with sponsors coming on board and you know having access I mean I'm talking about being able to train in the same facility for the same week being fed up training like things that we've started out with that showers are you know, basic basics. And, and, and yeah. when you get when you get that in place like I, I really do think the game over the last five years the level of development that we've had in the women's game is probably what the men's game has had over you know 10 or 12 years like we're at the pace You're of the acceleration faster, because of the low base that we're coming from and we're, we're the the i suppose the use we could make of the resources we get is that's what i'm excited to see over the next decade i think the scale of the game the you know the way players can give more to their sport because they're being provided with more yeah um, i think that'll be interesting i just hope that it does sort of develop at a level playing field i, I wouldn't like to see either that you know, certain teams like, the, you know, big two or three, I guess, the Dubs have been dominant in the men's game, um, you know, and, and other teams, I think it's quite uh, much more of a level playing field in, in the women's game and I'd like to see, there's, there's always four or five teams that are knocking on the door for All-Ireland and I'd hope that that will grow and that, you know, some of the weaker counties that are, are I guess, struggling sometimes uh, year to year, like I know Leitrim hadn't fielded a team, um, you know, over the last yeah. couple of years. I'd hate to see counties being left behind as well. So yeah, and like in terms of the camogie as well, that probably needs to come come away as well. Yeah, um, like the camogie, um, you know, they've been really progressive with the real changes that they brought in. Yeah. Excited to see how they go in the league. Um, I think speeding up the pace of the game and you making know, the feedback from from kind of the game. players that yeah. are playing the game. I said we don't need to be have a, a rule where we can hand pass the ball into the goal. Like we're, yeah. our skills are better than that, please. You know, yeah. can we change this? So I think that's great to see, um, you know, that sort of progression. Look at, look at the pace of change and how long it takes to make one real change in the men's game. And they've brought in six real changes just like that. And you're going to trial it in the league and, you know, get on with it and it's see how, how it goes. Be, yeah. It's how it should be. I mean, you know, I think the pace of change in the organisations is, is good on the women's side. It's progressive. And if it's you can get fast. the support to back that up, I think over the next decade, um, commercially, hopefully, with sponsorship and you know a bit of funding coming in to, to the sports to, to boost it up that you know teams to be able to really direction. yeah get the the player base and the skill base up and then ultimately you'll have more people wanting to play and seeing the, the faces and you know yeah getting to know everyone mm. and how do you feel about next decade yeah, well, it'll be <laughs> quite similar I think you know across all women's sports it'll be similar um on a personal level down in Munster we don't quite have the structures in hockey as there there is in Leinster and up north sure yeah um, so we're behind all the time so you know I hope to see that radicalized and the numbers it's not seen as elitist is it sometimes I Do think it, I think it depends where you come from you know I like saying Limerick is the sporting craft of Ireland because you know I'm from <laughs> because it, I'm from Limerick <laughs> from inner city um, <laughs> in Janesboro, you know, a working class, um, uh, working class little town, I suppose, I don't know what to call it, just on the outside of city, like it was in the city. And, you know, well, hockey might not have been the main sport for most of us growing up, it would have been soccer, playing the boys, but yeah. it was still available to me. And I don't think that happens all around the country. You know, I think it doesn't matter in Limerick where you're from, like you can play different sports. Whereas sometimes when I come to Dublin, there seems to be a feeling that hockey is elitist, whereas that's never what I've experienced growing up in Limerick. Yeah, that's mad, isn't it? Um, so it's just different viewpoints. Um, but I, you know, I, I suppose it's having access to those as well, because we, I remember we talked to some school children before about what they wanted to play and they were being forced to play football when they wanted to play basketball or there isn't really the choice for them yeah absolutely and the well, five new hockey clubs have actually been opened in munster um in the past six months you know one down in trilly 
Yeah. Which is mad out in Ennis. Um, God, you know, yeah, it's really strange. You know, it's in places that you'd never even imagine it. Mm. But then at the same time, um, you know, there are idols down there. Like Naomi Carroll is a Clare woman um, who plays camogie and football for Clare, has over 110 caps. Like there should be a hockey club in Clare. Yeah, you know, it's, absolutely. It's an obvious one. Um, it's the visibility yeah. piece as well, like from, yeah. you know, how well the, the international team is doing. That, I think that's filtering down to clubs getting involved and kids getting involved and seeing it. and. Have yeah. the opportunities yeah. to, as you said, pick what's worse, you know, and have you a choice of all of them. Yeah. And play as many as you can for as long as you can. Exactly. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming in and have a lovely Christmas and good luck next year. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks Whatever a million.